Well, this is COP26. Thomas, I can tell you, I've been to most of them. And so I'm very much aware of the games and that go on and the negotiations, the language is arcane. Um, a lot of what happens is, you know, we are playing poker. We are playing poker, you know, cards are dealt under the table. And yet I agree with the IPCC because those are the, those are the scientific experts, but we are beyond. Uh, we are not going to be able to go be, be below 1.5, even though that was our target in 2015. Hello everyone, welcome to the fourth Global Leadership Masterclass. I'm very happy to facilitate today. Um, it's a program created by the Open Diplomacy Institute with the support of HEAP, uh, our uh, academic partner today. I'm very happy to enter into this fourth conversation with um, Ambassador Judy Wakungu from Kenya. Judy is uh, currently the ambassador of Kenya to France and many other European uh, countries, but she has previously um, to that post uh, being in charge of environmental issues in the cabinet of, of Kenya. She was a uh, cabinet secretary for environment uh, in that African country. And she's uh, had in that position, a extensive leadership experience in delivering uh, the sustainable development goals. We'll talk about her role uh, as a leader fighting for a fairer and, and, and greener uh, world. We'll get through different topics, biodiversity, climate, uh, and, and, and plastics issues. And therefore, I remind everyone that you, have a, you are expected to ask as many questions as possible to our leader today uh, in this Global Leadership Masterclass meant to discuss the experience and draw lessons from what we will have the pleasure to hear today. I'm happy to welcome Judy in this conversation. And as usual, welcome, Judy. Thank, thank you very much, Thomas. Um, I'm very happy to, to have you today. Um, we will, um, yeah, we will um, certainly cover many aspects of your experience, but we will, if if I may, uh, I've already introduced you. You are now in a diplomatic position. You you were pre prior to that in a more political position, but I, I'd like to step back uh, before you get to Paris. We are actually um, neighbors, but I'd like to bring us back to Nairobi and 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 look back at the 2014 Act you passed uh, to fight illegal wildlife trade. Um, uh, we all have in mind rhino horn and, and many species uh, endangered by um, illegal wildlife trade. What is interesting in that uh, experience you've been through is, is the reasons why um, you, you, you were active in, in, in promoting that bill and the results you got from there. I, I'd like to start from this experience you could tell us about and may, maybe draw uh, lessons from that experience to, to connect to the current global agenda, if, if I may. You, you, you can tell us about this experience, Judy, first. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Um, the reason I pushed to enact the Kenya Wildlife uh, and Conservation Act, which came into effect in 2014, was that at that time, uh, in 2013, when I came into office and prior to that, uh, poaching was extremely high, extremely high. Poaching of elephants and poaching of rhino was extremely high, not only in Kenya, but in many African countries. These keystone species were definitely endangered. To understand how this works is that the poachers are not just that small person 
that goes to poach, but these are international syndicates. And these international syndicates are involved in all manner of illicit trade, in flora, in fauna, in human trafficking, you know, and also in uh, counterfeit uh, goods. Now, we were losing several elephants at a, an extremely high rate. We were also losing several rhino also at an extremely high rate. Now, the challenge for Kenya at that time is that not only were we a source country, but we were also a transit country. So in other words, there was poaching that was happening in Kenya, but also our ports of entry and our ports of exit were also not secure. Part of the challenge that we also had in Kenya is that the law at that time was very, was not punitive enough to deter the poachers. In fact, it almost served as an incentive for the poachers. In other words, they would get caught. And then um, if they went to a magistrate, the magistrates, also the judiciary, were not educated well enough at that time. So it was very punitive. The idea then was to make this an economic crime. In other words, poaching of elephants and rhino, an economic crime, and also to increase the penalties. Now, this was a very difficult task in Kenya because of the competing interests. People have various perspectives on hunting, for example. People have various perspectives on their philosophy of what conservation ought to be. So although there have been many, many, many iterations of amendments to the law, this hadn't taken place for over 20 years. Now, we, we came in and I was appointed as part of this new government. And of course, when new governments come in, they have all sorts of promises. So I took the opportunity because one of the promises was conservation and to reduce poaching. So I took this opportunity to work with all of our conservationists, those in government, those in the private sector, those um, uh, that run their own uh, conservation, either international NGOs or national NGOs. And we worked together and within six months, you know, which was historic, within six months we were unable to enact this law. Now, what happened immediately after that is because the penalties were now extremely high. We also had to educate the judiciary that this is an economic crime. Yeah, and I'd like to, to take it from here because you, you've, uh, you've insisted uh, on the notion of economic crime, which makes it a little bit different from what we usually have in mind to fight against trafficking, which is more of a, cr a criminal issue in itself. I'm happy to, to learn more about this notion of economic crime you, you've been fighting for and advocating to, to crack down on this, on this problem because it, it has made a difference in the way you approach the issue, right? We, yeah, we need just uh, you to open your mic. Um, yes, of course, it has made a tremendous uh, difference. One, the penalties are extremely high. At that time, they were the highest in the world, but many countries have followed our example. Why is it an economic crime? Biodiversity, the keystone species, provide ecosystem services. And these are ecosystem services that we now don't even know how to calculate what it is economically. So poaching them, killing them, um, costs us in terms of economic, e ecosystem services. And of course, you know the notions about payment of ecosystem services. Now, secondly, um, tourism is one of our most important sectors. Tourists come to view uh, these animals, especially the keystone species, the elephants and the, and the rhino, uh, especially. This is an economic crime because without these keystone species and the ecosystem services that they provide, tourists, tourists would not be able to come to visit Kenya and therefore not support this very important sector to us. And that is why it is an economic crime. And you, you, you were very clear on the notion of ecosystemic uh, ecosystem services. I'd like to maybe 
draw the next um, chapter of our conversation on that notion. As we enter the UN decade for ecosystems restoration, which is uh, a major uh, diplomatic framework to enhance our ability to, to take care of biodiversity um, in, in general for oceans, for um, terrestrial ecosystems. The notion of ecosystem services is key because it changes the outlook of uh, businesses on nature. And I'm happy to maybe to understand how you define, just for the sake of our understanding in the group, how you define this ecosystem services. As you pointed out, it's very difficult to measure, but it's probably because it's difficult to measure that it's invaluable and, and then absolutely pr uh, a priority to, to pr protect. So I'd like to maybe to develop a bit that notion of ecosystem services and to understand how it is key to design the next uh, framework for global governance on biodiversity. Well, you've already described, I don't want to get into, into the definitions of what ecosystem services is, because of course those are very much in the textbooks, but ecosystem services are the clean water that we enjoy, uh, the air, the clean air that we uh, enjoy, the uh, trees uh, around us, the soils uh, around us. Many of these attributes are considered in standard economics as externalities, but this is exactly what it is that we depend on for life. And this is why the ecosystem services are extremely uh, important. And like I said, I don't want to go into those textbook uh, definitions of what it is, because I'm sure many of the um, participants here already know from their courses. Yeah, the importance here was to, to understand that um, We've been looking at nature as we were a side nature or above nature as human beings, but we are part of nature and we depend uh, as one among many other species on ecosystem services. And it is why it has been put on the top of the environmental agenda of the UN. Um, we are not only going into the UN decade on ecosystems restoration because we have harmed them, but we are also going towards uh, the COP15 uh, on biodiversity in Kunming, China. Uh, we usually have in mind the COPs for climate, but there are also COPs for, um, for desert desertification as well as uh, biodiversity. This year it's the 15th one, and it's meant to design a post Aishi framework for global governance on biodiversity, where so many words to say we need a global approach to, to protect our nature. Uh, it's often said that the, the COP15 is probably being uh, slided back to 2022 again, after it was postponed once already. How, danger, how dangerous is that uh, for us to, to keep postponing discussions at a global level on biodiversity? Uh, I think, uh, Thomas, for me, what we need to do is just get on with the knowledge we already have. We already know that it is our lifestyles that are destroying our biodiversity. We know that. It is up to the leadership of each country. It's up to the leadership of each person. Quite frankly, when we go to these meetings, it's a, ma it's a matter of parties negotiating. So we spent a lot of time with new verbiage. So COP15 has new verbiage. Then COP16 will have new verbiage. Let's just use our common sense and do what is right. So we start by our own selves, and then we move up to the leadership of each particular government. We can meet the way we are meeting. I can see you, you can see me, the technology is available. Um, we are all digitally literate nowadays. Diplomacy has become digital diplomacy. We just need to get on with what it is that we need to do. If we put into practice what we discussed, in the last uh, COP, what we ought to be doing is assessing what have we achieved, and each country can do that. What have we achieved in terms of meeting the objectives that we agreed upon? And don't forget that once we ratify many of these agreements, they become part and parcel of our laws, which means we are now beholden 
to those particular standards. But it's really about being selfish, thinking about yourself, thinking about your country, and thinking about future generations. If we're not able to go to Kunming, does that mean life will stop? No, it won't, because we already have the knowledge. Yes, it is important to meet, but let's not say we are holding or postponing our commitments because we are unable to meet because of the prevailing pandemic and other issues. But what you just said gives us a, um, a careful lesson uh, of leadership, getting to achieve things and not to talk. Um, getting to international summits that pledge to do things, to deliver promises and not to new language, which makes a huge difference from what, from what we've been used to so far. And, and that's exactly what's supposed to happen in Glasgow for the COP26 on climate, aimed at delivering um, climate action. And I may say also leverage or scale up our climate action. Before we speak about Glasgow, I'd like to re revert back to your experience um, as a, a cabinet secretary for the environment in Kenya, um, where in 2016, 2016, yes, you passed uh, the Climate Change Act. 2016 means it was right after the Paris Climate Agreement, probably one of the most uh, fast, uh, one of the fastest countries getting to commitments and to action. I'd like, uh, please, uh, Jody, you to explain us how you've designed that Climate Change Act and what was its impact? How did it change the trajectory, the carbon trajectory of, of your country? And uh, what results you, look, you, you, can, you can assess um, five years after this Climate Act? Uh, yes, we were all here in Paris in uh, 2015, uh, December. And as you've already mentioned, Thomas, it was one of the most seminal uh, climate uh, environment and even climate meetings. Most of the heads of state were here. Uh, significant uh, commitments were made at that time. Now, Kenya has always been extremely active in issues of not only environment, but issues of climate change. And there had been various attempts to actually have a climate change law uh, in Kenya. But you know, this, this is very uh, political. So it just so happened that the timing and the commitments that we made as a country coming into, uh, into Paris, straight after the Paris Agreement, ratifying the commitments that we made, the natural step for Kenya was also to commit this in law because you know we we we, we ratified the 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 agreement and like I said this had been a long standing process in Kenya we we've got uh, a very active uh, and committed group of experts representing various organisations in in Kenya that don't do anything else except climate change work and climate change advocacy so these people were in my face every day. Uh, some are friendly, some are not so friendly, you know, and so on. So we were very active in ensuring that every single sector in Kenya reduces its carbon footprint. And so as to, to zoom on that action, what were the most uh, difficult um, sectors to, to work with to reduce your carbon footprint? Having in mind that uh, Kenya is um, uh, a country developing itself, a fast growth country that obviously as many developing countries or emerging countries uh, has an increasing uh, carbon footprint. So how did you combine um, both your environmental and climate objectives with the, uh, the, the need to develop the country itself? What we were able to demonstrate, and this is a work in progress, you know, it's a work in, in progress and amendments to the law continue up to this day. Let me give you the example of, say, the, the energy sector. The energy sector was successful in reducing the carbon footprint by ensuring that uh, most, of the most of our energy resources are now renewable. 
So for example, geothermal energy plays a significant component in the electricity sector and also uh, solar and wind. In fact, Kenya now has the, the largest uh, wind power uh, generation, uh, about 330 megawatts or so in Africa. The transport sector is still very difficult because it's still fossil fuel uh, reliant. So transport, difficult, but also a work in progress. Um, we've invested heavily in mass transit and continue to do so, and also very much so in partnership with, with France uh, and, other, and other countries. Transport, difficult, but there are plans of reducing our footprint there. Uh, another sector that was also a bit difficult is the agriculture sector. Although we have, we're extremely knowledgeable when it comes to climate smart uh, agriculture, these practices have not been put in place. And when it comes to uh, large scale um, agriculture, uh, our carbon footprint is quite high because we are still uh, dependent on uh, petrochemicals, fertilizers, and so on. But the idea was of this law is to ensure that every single sector monitors its carbon footprint and therefore reduces that carbon footprint, ultimately ensuring that the country will uh, benefit from reducing the, the, the carbon footprint. So I've just given you examples of what, where it worked, where it's still difficult, and it's still a work in progress. And as I say, Thomas, even up to now, the, the current law is, uh, continues to be amended. It's, it's very interesting. And, and I guess it gives us the second lessons of leadership, humility to, to recognize how work in progress it, it means to deliver such a transition. But what you've said um, about monitoring sector per sector, the um, reduction of emissions is important because that's the way we can structure a, a credible nationally determined contribution to achieve the Paris Climate Agreement. That brings me back to the COP26 um, in Glasgow I just mentioned earlier. So the COP26 climate is meeting in, in, in Scotland in, in the upcoming month. Uh, it's meant to deliver on the promise of universal uh, pledges to achieve carbon neutrality by uh, as, as fast as possible and to keep us below the target of plus 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. Do we hear many, many um, IPCC experts uh, and leaders saying we are now going way beyond the target, uh, almost up to plus five degrees by the end of the century. And when we see light and burning in 24 hours, just because there is a, 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 a specific global warming uh, phenomenon in the Northern American um, countries, we, we can see and witness how uh, uh, fast the change is, is getting us into the, uh, the ordeal of climate. So I'm curious to know, have you lost hope since uh, this low? And do you still believe we can achieve uh, the plus 1.5 degrees that you agreed on uh, in Paris? Or have you, have you lost um, the directions? Well, first of all, you know, you've asked several questions. First of all, do I still believe in the, the Kenyan law? Yes, I believe in the Kenyan law. Uh, but in terms of internationally, have I lost hope? Now, this is COP26. Thomas, I can tell you, I've been to most of them. And so I'm very much aware of the games and that go on and the negotiations, the language is arcane. Um, a lot of what happens is, you know, we are playing poker. We are playing poker, you know, cards are dealt under the table. And yet, I agree with the IPCC because those are the those are the scientific experts, but we are beyond. Uh, we are not going to be able to go be, below 1.5, even though that was our target in 2015. The trajectory, according to the IPCC, as you say, it's even beyond four degrees. Beyond four degrees, we'll all be frying. 
So the question is, as we go to Glasgow, are we ambitious enough? Now, countries have already submitted their NDCs. Uh, for example, you know, Kenya's is even more ambitious than the previous one in terms of reducing the, the, the carbon footprint. But then there are countries that are in serious trouble. For example, the small island states, uh, the SIDS, are in serious trouble. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, issues to do with erratic weather. The, what used to be a fire season now in many countries, for example, in California, uh, there's not a, there isn't a fire season. It is every day. Um, hurricanes are also a daily basis. We can't even keep up with them. You know, we run out of the alphabet, alphabet before we even get to uh, halfway through the year. Now, with such realities, sea level rise is real and we're seeing it. Now, with such realities, as we move on to Glasgow and COP26, my interest is in the fact that are countries ambitious enough to make these commitments? We've seen some very good examples in different uh, uh, countries. I don't want to mention them here, but I think most significantly, it's good that the United States is back on the table uh, because of the leadership that the US uh, can, uh, can provide. But the question is, are we ambitious enough? That is the question. It's and And this is for the industrialized countries, uh, surely, to discuss. Um, the countries that are most adversely affected are not com uh, don't contribute much to this carbon footprint. So are countries ambitious enough? Uh, and this is, and, or are they committed enough? This is the question and the answers that should be provided post uh, Glasgow for COP26. But again, as I've mentioned before, uh, protecting the environment is common sense. It's common sense. And it's a matter of what it is and the decisions that we make every single day. And that all of our leaders, ourselves included, must be accountable. That is the question as we go into uh, uh, COP26. Issues of loss and damage will have to be taken seriously. Issues of adaptation, financing, will also have to be taken very seriously. Promises have been made and yet they are never uh, met. Where is the issue of justice? You know, the issues of justice will also have to be discussed instead of just being thrown under the rug as always. So these are my expectations for COP26, but like I've said, we must be acting on it now. It's, it's absolutely uh, meaningful to us to hear the shared uh, lessons of leadership I can draw from what you just said. It's all about accountability too. I spoke about humility, I spoke about courage. The third aspect um, that I, I like to highlight in what you just said is the important uh, notion of being able to uh, respond to criticism and to account for decisions made and actually implemented. That, that is a very well um, um, connected to the third um, achievement you had as a Minister of the Environment in Kenya, I'd like to discuss, I mean there, the 2017 Act to ban single plastic bags you've passed. Um, when we discussed and prepped together this uh, conversation, you, tell, you told me it was the most difficult law you had to, to deal with, uh, which is interesting because uh, we could have expected climate issues to be even more difficult uh, because more uh, transversal, more uh, talking to, to every sector of the economy. But when we spoke together, you said banning single plastics bags were was even more difficult or painful. I, I said painful, you said more risky. Can you tell me a bit more about uh, why this experience was so specific in your leadership role at, as the cabinet minister for the environment? Well, you know, the issue of course 
was difficult, not only for me, it is difficult in every single, uh, in every single country. Why? Because plastics are ubiquitous. We use plastics for everything. And I'm talking about single use plastics. It had got to the point where uh, even buying water, for example, in uh, informal uh, settlements, especially, uh, you would get uh, water sold to you in uh, a plastic bag. Uh, I'm not even talking about the bottle. You know, that's another, another, another battle altogether. But you buying water in a plastic bag, buying kerosene in a plastic bag. Um, if I bought three tomatoes, the, the tomatoes would be in three plastic bags. You know, it was just throwaway. Not only that, we have littering and waste management issues. Um, you know, in Kenya and many other parts um, uh, of the world where waste management is a challenge. What was then happening with these bags is they were just, you barely use it for 10 minutes and then it's just thrown away. So landscapes were littered, absolutely littered with plastic bags. These plastic bags were going into our waterways, into our rivers, into the ocean. Uh, and also we know very well in terms of the challenge of uh, microplastics in our food streams. So the issue was extremely difficult because of course we have uh, a manufacturing uh, uh, industries uh, that are huge, that are growing, that also rely on, the, on, these particular, on this particular material. So the lobbies, the, the manufacturers were definitely against it. Uh, many industrialists were against it, um, and many people were also against it because of the just the efficiency of using the, the, the plastics. I had to convey the message that plastics are pollutants. You know, plastics are pollutants. Yes, it's a very durable material, but also you have to realize that 90% of the plastics for the last 60 years that were manufactured still exist today. We talk about recycling, but our recycling culture has not yet matured. And so recycling needed to be stepped up. But we also have alternatives. We have more materials that are just as convenient, that are compostable, that are also biodegradable. So we also needed to provide opportunities for these other industries and innovations, particularly by young people in our country, we needed to also to give them space um, to generate also um, more environmentally uh, friendly materials uh, and grow these industries. Our view really was that Kenya to become a leader uh, in some of these areas. Now, it was difficult because the the, the manufacturers, not all, and again, when I talk about manufacturers, I don't want to make it appear as if it's monolithic, no. Uh, the manufacturers, of course, were against it. Now, if you look at Kenya's history, again, we had talked about this for many, many, many years. You know, for over 10 years, we had talked about, um, you know, banning single-use uh, plastics. Uh, but of course, the decision was very, was very difficult. My concern was that, first of all, uh, our health was at stake, environmental health uh, was at stake, and also we just needed as a country and as a culture to stop wanton littering we will, we and, will, and promote we'll, circular economy practices. I'm sure we will cover again the topic of environmental um, health after um, after we close this uh, conversation and welcome um, uh, panelists from the audience to ask you a question. But before we get there, I'd like to cover a last question uh, I had in mind. You just outlined how important it is to deal with plastic bags and plastic, single-use plastics ever to have 
a an alternative economy to, to for waste management, which needs to 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 have a global approach because, as we know, uh, northern countries are are not managing their waste themselves; they are exporting their, their waste to southern countries, which it, which brings us back to a global issue. That is, we don't have any single global political arena to address this issue. Though so, there is no framework to discuss these aspects. Unlike, I know that there is uh, some some uh, pathways to deal with this issue at the African Union level, but that's at the regional level. And I'd like uh, you please to help us understanding what the AU does at its, at its regional level and how you expect um, a global arena to emerge to discuss these issues of, uh, of uh, plastics management? Um, in terms of just the waste um, in general, uh, there is the, the Basel Convention uh, on hazardous waste. The reason the African Union decided to um, have the Bamako, the Bamako Convention is that uh, at the African Union level and uh, at the AMSEN level, the African uh, Ministers of Environment level, this was way back, I think in 1998 or so, felt that we were not protected enough on hazardous waste by the Basel. And that's why the Bamako Convention is much more, uh, say, draconian on issues of uh, hazardous waste and beyond. And so this means preventing African countries from uh, importing waste, especially from industrialized countries, but also transboundary um, hazardous waste. Enforcing it, of course, has been uh, extremely difficult. Enforcing it has been difficult, but at least the convention is in place. And, you know, there are meetings periodically to assess how we are faring, and also to ensure that you know African countries are complying uh, with this particular uh, convention, and also just providing state-of-the-art knowledge as to what it is that we ought to do to protect ourselves. When it comes to the issue of uh, plastics, uh, the United Nations Environment Program has been very active um, in ensuring uh, that countries uh, abide by circular economy standards and especially those dealing with issues of uh, plastics. The World Economic Forum is also becoming extremely active on the issue of plastics, especially uh, in connection with oceans. Uh, we know very well that uh, most of the plastics that we use end up in the ocean. And in fact, there are projections that by uh, 2050, um, most of our waterways will be littered with plastics if we don't do something drastic. So internationally, yes, we're talking about it, but again, individually, uh, at the country, at the regional level, at the country level, but also at the personal level, we must make these tough choices. Maybe uh, I can draw a last lesson of leadership from what you just said. Uh, we must align our collective decision with our indiv individual decisions and behavior. And that what's defined a, a leader to, to me. Uh, that's a very personal uh, conception of leadership, but I, I believe it's very true. Um, to discuss everything you've covered, which is already very, very important, we have many questions from the audience. Um, I will welcome uh, two um, listeners uh, together uh, in, in two rounds. Uh, and first, I'd like to bring to the conversation Emma and Nour, who will ask you questions, uh, each of them. I'd like Emma and Noor to ask the, the questions in a row so that Judy, you can answer the two of them in one single answer. Maybe Emma first and then Noor afterwards. 
Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Emma Ching and I'm from Nairobi, Kenya. I really admire the work that Professor Judy Wangkungu does. And the question I'd like to ask her um, is with regards to how more youth can be included in the sustainability and conservation conversation and also with regards to how young people can get access to funding when it comes to their conservation projects. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma, for that very important question. Use at the table is always key when we speak about future generations. It's all about us with us. And I'm sure the question of Nu is, is gonna be different, but ask with the same spirit, right, Nu? Kind of, yeah, you're, you're definitely right, Toma, and thank you so much for having me here. So I would like to ask Her Excellency, do, does Kenya and do other neighbor countries within the African uh, continent actually have the means to fulfill this transition and to go greener, especially that we know that um, any transition, any economical change, must be related to political stability and safety. And what we're seeing now, for example, in Mali or in any other African country because of famine, because of civil wars or any other problems that unfortunately our continent is, uh, is facing right now, can we, if, can we overcome that to, in, to actually get the means to fulfill and achieve this greener transition? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Noah. I, I like, am I not to stay at the screen with us so that Judy can answer your questions about youth involvement and, and the means we need to cover our objectives. Judy, feel free to take the two questions in the row you'd like. Uh, let, let me start with, uh, with Emma, of course, I'm <laughs> with Emma or Chiang because I'm being very patriotic here, but it's also the order in which the, the questions were, were posed. Uh, Emma, my biggest inspiration when it comes to environment work is the youth. And um, Kenya has a very, very active uh, a community of youth on the environment. And they deal with many, many issues. Some uh, deal with wildlife conservation, some deal with issues of hazardous waste, some deal with pollution. So there are so many opportunities for you, uh, Emma, when it comes to joining one of these groups and what your passion is when it comes to youth. When it comes to funding, uh, there are also many uh, organizations, many of the philanthropies that you can look to towards, uh, as, as say, uh, uh, a youth uh, of interest. Many of the philanthropies, the Ford Foundation, UNEP also has some funding uh, for, for, for youth, the Rockefeller Foundation. Many, just look up the philanthropies, uh, the Hewlett Packard Foundation, for example. Just look up these foundations and see the component and their interests when it comes to the environment and also specifically their focus on the youth. But in Kenya, you're in very good company. Uh, they were my toughest critic, but also my toughest supporters. And they used to write to me every day and some follow me to this day. So you're in good company. Noor, your question is uh, very loaded. Loaded in the sense that uh, you're dealing about environmental security and then we also have challenges with political security. When it comes to issues of environmental security and the tra transition we need to take, the pathway that we need to take, I believe that we can leap from uh, technology. We don't have to follow the transition step by step the way the industrialized countries did. We can leapfrog. Uh, technology. We, we don't have to use coal, for example. We can go straight to using solar and wind. So I believe that we can. Now, however, when it comes to political insecurity, I agree with you. Political insecurity deters and disrupts uh, development. 
So we have to work on both. We have to ensure that our countries are politically uh, stable, but at the same time, we also have to uh, promote sustainable uh, development. Loaded question, but that's the best answer I have for you at the moment. Thank you, Noor. Thank you so much, uh, Judy, and thank you, Noor and, and Emma for those questions. I'd like to maybe, if I may, add um, an item for the agenda of Emma's. Um, uh, as everyone knows, there is this uh, international union uh, for the conservation of nature that meets this year in France, in Marseille, that has a youth group that is very active in involving young leaders in conservation issues. I am sure that, Emma, we, you will find many pathways of engagement to commit with in that, in that realm. Um, if you look at the IUCN, uh, summit that happens um, uh, in, in September in France. It's a global uh, uh, arena that, that has roots in Kenya itself. Uh, Judy will tell us about this, I'm sure, but uh, you will, uh, I'm, I'm very um, certain of, find very good ways to engage in that, in that uh, space if, if you aim at it. Um, to keep our conversations, I'd like to bring to the conversation uh, three other speakers from the uh, from the audience, um, Hildegard, uh, Nadia, and Brian. Welcome to the three of you. Um, keep your screens on up to the end of that uh, chapter of the conversation. It's uh, funnier with uh, smiles uh, than without. Um, I'd like to to give um, the floor first to Hildegard to ask a question then to Brian and then to Nadia. And, and feel free to ask your questions in a row and Judy will answer them. Good afternoon, uh, Judy and Thomas. Thank you for the invitation also to attend uh, the Global Leadership Masterclass. Um, the question that I have for Judy is how do you realize a common purpose that makes sense for all actors involved? and I'm not talking only about Kenya then, but about actors in the rest of the world. It seems that it is a question to me about awareness or willing to be aware of this issue more than being ambitious. ambitious. So I think ambitious, ambition comes later. Um, and um, the question is uh, um, an awareness of being responsibility or to take the responsibility for what you stand for at this moment. Thank you, Hildegard. I'll, I'll pass the mic to Brian. If, if, if I may, you could state the country you're from because I'm sure this masterclass is indeed very global. Hey, good evening, all of you. I believe you can hear me. Yes. My name is Brian. Uh, I'm from Kenya also, but I'm living and working in Rwanda. Sorry. My question is that uh, in the recent past, uh, during the starting from the millennium, we've seen uh, a growth in urban centers. There is a lot of uh, urbanization going on. And due to that, there is a lot of pressure on resources. There is increasing pollution. And also the, the issue as uh, uh, Judy stated that there is a problem in especially solid waste management. So uh, my question was, uh, what are the reasonable approaches that maybe either to is uh, to slow down uh, urbanization of which uh, to my idea, urbanization is not anywhere close to slowing down, but it's on the, on the rise. So what, what are the possible uh, solutions that governments can employ to ease the pressure on resources and also to facilitate especially urban dwellers to access to especially clean water and also uh, an issue of air pollution, which is really a problem, yeah. Thank you so much, Brian. That also circles back to the question on the means that Nus uh, asked right before there, how can we uh, enhance our resources to, to cover the to address the issue. Nadia, your question will be the last one of that masterclass. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, the emergence of zoonotic diseases like COVID-19 can largely be attributed to unsustainable human activities, such as pool land use and illegal wildlife trade. Uh, what lessons do you think uh, can be drawn from the current crisis, especially regarding our relation to nature in order to prevent maybe the next one? Thank you so much. So we have three very cross-cutting questions. Uh, Judy, I'm sure you will enjoy covering them. Feel free to pick up uh, the one you'd like to start with in the row you, you prefer. I'm learning to be a diplomat, so I'm going to go in the, in the order in which uh, the questions were posed. So I'll start with uh, uh, Hildegard. You know, Hildegard, I think it's raising awareness is important and you can raise awareness in various ways. Uh, you know, for example, young children in school nowadays, they learn more about the environment than say we did. You know, I'm a woman of a certain age. Then we have various uh, opportunities. A forum such as this allows us to raise awareness and to exchange ideas. Large organizations, the United uh, Nations Environment Program, uh, for, for example, the IUCN that Thomas just mentioned. Nowadays, even when it comes to media, there's a lot of dedication to issues environment in the media. So yes, it's raising awareness and then also being, um, showing, leading by example, uh, leading by example, practicing circular economy uh, practices and then taking that responsibility and then doing this over and over again. Um, many parents tell me that it's actually their children who come home and um, you're smiling, so it must be happening to somewhere that you know, and then tell their parents what to do uh, about how not to waste so much, uh, what materials they ought to be using. So if this becomes a daily practice, that is how we raise awareness, we practice it ourselves, and then before we know it, it becomes part of the, the culture. So that's what I would say about your question. Uh, Brian, I see Kenya is very popular here. Brian, I hope you're doing well uh, in, uh, in Rwanda. I also appreciate your question very much about urbanization and what urbanization does and the challenges it presents in terms of service delivery. Service delivery such as waste, where do you get your water, uh, issues of pollution, how do you cook your food, uh, and so on. Now, in terms of the demographic transition that we are in, and the reality of many of our economies, it means that people move towards urban areas to enhance their livelihoods, because that's where the jobs uh, most likely to be because that's where the industries are most likely to be. Many countries, uh, you know, Kenya included, um, have tried to uh, decentralize uh, and try to not make the capitals uh, the hub. So it's just not Nairobi or just Mombasa, but to try and decentralize uh, in, in all parts of the country to allow us to provide better services for the people. Now, this also has to be designed right from the beginning. So we have to plan by designing those particular services. Unfortunately for us, it's always an afterthought. You will find that people have congregated in a specific area and then we think, where are they going to get their water? Or where are the ablution uh, blocks? So we have to think in advance, but again, also when it comes to technology and service provision, the technologies are available for us to be able to provide these services. It's not easy, um, but we can do it. When it comes to air pollution, uh, especially in the uh, urban and suburban areas, it's mostly uh, transportation, uh, which of course is fossil fuel dependent. And then at the same time, it is also how we cook. Uh, many people use uh, kerosene as firewood 
becomes less uh, available. But for me, I would say we have to plan, we have to anticipate where the urban growth is going to be, and then we design accordingly. So that's my answer uh, to you, Brian. Um, Nadia, yes, we are learning a lot uh, about pushing nature too far from this current uh, pandemic, especially because of the zoonotic diseases. If we push nature too far, we're going to be having to just adjust to living with one pandemic after the other. The issue of balance in biodiversity is critically important. Nature was designed in a specific way. We're pushing it a bit too far. And this has been and continues to be a very bitter lesson. So let's not push nature too far. And so for some of us, when we are very protective about our protected areas, uh, people think that we're weird. Yeah, they actually do think that we're weird, that you know, uh, uh, we should just uh, develop, uh, put up buildings, you know, wherever there is space. But no, it comes back to the issue of ecosystem services and payment of ecosystem services. So we have to be extremely careful going forward. This has been a very expensive lesson, and it continues to be in terms of the number of people that we have lost and also what it has done to our economies. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you so much, Judy, for covering those uh, three cross-cutting questions. Uh, I'd like to thank Nadia, Hildegard and Brian for having uh, joined the conversation uh, today, as well as Emma and Nu. It's very important to have questions, in insights, uh, uh, remarks from the audience uh, in, 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 in these masterclasses because leadership is all about uh, the courage to, to humbly recognize this, it's under work and to account for the achievements and for the risks as well as the lessons we took away from what we did, uh, what, what you achieved. Judy Wakungu, I remind our audience you are today ambassador of Kenya to France Portugal, Slovenia, and, and many other European jurisdictions. And you were a long lasting cabinet secretary for the environment in Kenya with three milestones we've discussed today, uh, fighting illegal wildlife trade, uh, passing the Climate Change Act right after the COP21 uh, uh, in climate in Paris, and also fighting against single use plastics. Many lessons learned from your experience and your ability to share this experience. I'd like to thank you very warmly for the time you, you gave us uh, to, to reflect on, on your experience and to share your lessons. Thank you very much. Best luck for the next steps of your leadership. Uh, we wish you uh, to keep achieving uh, protecting our planet. That's a topic we'll keep covering every day uh, at the Open Diplomacy Institute. Um, the next Global Leadership Masterclass is certainly in September. I can announce that, the, that there is one programmed in November already with the former EU uh, Commissioner for the Environment, uh, Mrs. Connie Hildegard, which was certainly a colleague of Judy Wakungu when she was in office uh, in Kenya. Uh, by that time, I wish you uh, very good holidays in summer, enjoying <laughs> global warming and, and beaches, which is important at the same times. Thank you so much to watch this uh, conversation and Global Leadership Masterclass created by the Open Diplomacy with the uh, support of uh, HEIP. We warmly thank too for their support. Goodbye. <laughs>